I don't know if I have any time. No. I don't. <laughs> OK. Uh, uh, thank you very much. We'll, we'll have a bit of time during uh, discussion, but I wouldn't want to cut off my colleague, Jerry uh, Doppel, who uh, is a professor of philosophy. His most recent publications in philosophy of science and inquiry last year. And uh, he's the winner of basically all of the university's teaching awards, including an academic senate distinguished teaching award. And so, oh, Jerry. Good. Well, I'm glad to come after uh, those uh, great talks because I don't have to cover some of the things that you uh, dramatize very, very clearly. So one thing I want to stress is that when I came here, um, this was a department in transition. Uh, basically, Marcuse had had a tremendous influence on the graduate program, and there were many students uh, interested in Marcuse's work political activists, people who had helped protect him when he received some of these threats. So that atmosphere was still here. But when I came, uh, Fred Olofsson had been chair for two or three years. Fred, it might be uh, important to note, Fred, like Dick Arneson and I, we all three of us were refugees from the new left. Fred was a refugee because he was a professor of education at Harvard and that, was, that school had seen a great deal of tumult and unpleasantness surrounding the war and the counterculture, uh, and he was a victim of it. So he took the opportunity to leave Harvard, though he thought that's where he wanted to spend the rest of his life, um, in Boston and at Harvard, and came here as chair. And when he came, uh, I mean, Fred Olofsson was a very powerful philosopher and a very powerful intellectual. He was my teacher at Johns Hopkins University. And actually, uh, in those days, he wasn't focusing on Heidegger. He focused on moral and political theory and philosophy of law. And I took several courses with him in those subjects. He actually mastered the whole history of philosophy. He had an enormous knowledge. And he was an intellectual, not just a philosopher. And he had a vision for the department. And the vision of the department was, his vision of the department was not that it would be dominated by Marxism and political theory. In fact, he was a bit uncomfortable with that as the major uh, reputation of the department. His vision was it would be a very well-rounded, broadly focused department in which every major tradition of philosophy would be represented. So there would be history of philosophy, there would be moral and political theory, there would be philosophy of language, there would be ethics, and so forth and so on. So he then set out to make the hires and direct the department so it would fulfill this vision of a truly uh, eclectic, uh, broad, and, and rich philosophical education for graduate students and undergraduates. So he then saw himself as a figure of transition. And he set about trying to hire people in various areas that would you know, realize this vision. So it was a period of transition. When I got here, however, um, I came here for an interview. And we, uh, I was taken out to uh, Herbert's favorite restaurant, the Rhinelander. And I was very impressed. Herbert was sitting there, and Olofsson was sitting there, and Ed Lee, Ed Lee, the classicist, who also was a teacher of mine, Johns Hopkins, and others. And I said, my god, you know, we have Fred was sort of a conservative. Um, basically, I knew what Marcuse stood for. I had taught his works at University of Pennsylvania. Um, I was really impressed. Plus. The other thing to notice is this was the period when American universities uh, had the possibility of infinite growth and development. There were positions everywhere at UCSD. The campus was expanding. There was no problem in making, in making hires. Everybody basically was getting jobs. That was the period from the 70s up to the 90s or whenever you want to end, end, end the period. So I was impressed by that, that there were many positions that were going to be filled. So I was very, very happy to be here. When I got here, I got along very well with Marcuse, not so much politically, because we really didn't you know, talk all that much about politics. Herbert was a great schmoozer. He had a tremendous sense of humor. And he, likes, he liked kibitzing. 
And I'll just tell you one or two anecdotes. So one time we went down to the, to the uh, Rhinelander for, I think, dinner. And we went out for a walk uh, on, in La Jolla Shores. And Herbert and I only had one philosophical discussion. He couldn't understand why I was working on rules. He said to me, Jerry, Jerry, why are you working on rules? He's a bourgeois philosopher. Why are you working on rules? And then the discussion was a discussion between the liberal democratic tradition as against the Marxist tradition as which was better placed in order to generate a transition to a more just society, or as we then thought of it as a democratic socialist society. So we were going on and on about this, looking at the, the merits and defects of Marxism and, and uh, the liberal democratic tradition, especially the, as it represented in Rawls' theory of justice, which was an overpowering work at that time. So we're talking and arguing and so forth, and after about five minutes, Herbert was like this, and he stopped, and he looked around, and there were, of course, surfers, um, there were people on skateboards, there were people sunbathing, uh, there were people on bikes. He looked around and he said, he said, Jerry, you know, if they knew what we were saying, they would kill us. <laughs> <laughs> One other quick anecdote. One time we were walking across campus having the same bloody discussion, and we ran into a, a dean, uh, Manny Rotenberg, right? So, Herbert said, it was very, Herbert was very civil, got along with everybody. He said, well, you know, how you doing? How you doing? And uh, he, Herbie, the dean, said, ah, surviving, surviving. And Marcuse said, and so, what is the evidence for that? <laughs> OK, so that gives you a sense of uh, the, the, the Marcuse that, that I, I knew and I remembered. Um, so Marx was still very important in the department. Uh, so when I got here, about a year after I got here, um, Dick Arneson and I decided we were going to teach a course on Marx, or maybe I taught it and Dick sat in on it. I don't, I don't really quite remember. Um, and we were both refugees from the, from the New Left, Dick coming out of Berkeley, and I was uh, you know, kicked out of University of Pennsylvania in about 1973 or 74, basically for teaching issues of war and peace and race and things like that, things that everybody is now expected to teach. But in those days, all you taught was God, free will, and the external world. That was it. No moral or political topic. So I was pushed out after three years uh, there uh, you know, for, that, for that reason. And uh, so I got here, and we decided, Dick and I decided, or I decided we'd teach this course on Marx. Now, Dick and I were both interested in Marx, um, and Marxism. But I was interested in the early Marx and uh, so-called Marxist humanism, and especially the concept of alienation and the, the idea of, uh, of a society beyond alienation. Dick was more interested in the economic writings, in capital, the notion of exploitation, in what came to be known as analytical Marxism. So, and, now, I sort of knew that, but I didn't really appreciate it, what it meant. So I was... Uh, maybe the second or third class I came in, and I had, I don't know, two or three hours of lecture on alienation. And then I got to this point where Marx, uh, in the man I believe in the manuscripts, is explaining uh, his conception of unalienated sex, unal unalienated sexuality. And, in and I was going on and on. You know, I was very taken by this. Unalienated sex is where neither party treats the other as an instrument of his or her own gratification. The sexual need is the need to fill all the needs of the other human being and all capacities to appreciate and fulfill the needs of others and all human beings are embodied in unalienated, true and authentic sexuality. So I'm going on and on about this feeling you know, at the top of my game. And then Dick, Dick, Dick says, uh, wait a minute, uh, I, uh, I, I, don't, uh, I don't get this. I, I have a, a counter example and I'm like, okay. What is it? Dick said, look, what's wrong with sexuality where each is using the other as an instrument for his or her own gratification? Provide they have equal time <laughs> and, you know, it works for both. What? That's not alienating. I mean, what's, what's wrong with that? Mutual instrumentalization. <laughs> and, you know, I'm like, okay. Uh, and then the students are like, <laughs> like that, you know. And I'm like, well, uh, Dick, uh, uh, I'm going to come back to that <laughs> in the next lecture. So this was basically the first seminar 
After that, Dick and I maybe gave eight or nine seminars together. But that set the tone. I realized it was going to be no sort of uh, professional courtesy, uh, no making the other person look good. In fact, you, you know, you, whatever you got, you shot. You know, that was it. And that probably was a progenitor early on of reality TV. Uh, the students would sit there and they'd go back and forth. As Dick would say something, I would say something. So we were ethics here for many years, like 15, 16 years, until we, we always wanted to hire other people in ethics and political theory. We didn't succeed until we hired, you know, David Brink and others. So that was, uh, that was this, this, the story, um, the early years I got here. And, you know, I really appreciated having Dick here, and for a very long time we interacted in a very interesting and, and, and productive way. I want to say a few other things. When I got here, um, philosophy of science was already present. Richard Rudner was a visitor. He was a major philosopher of social science and the editor of philosophy of science, just, had just published my very first article. He was here as a visitor. Helen Longinot, the well-known feminist philosopher of science, was here. Okay? And then she left at some point a few years later to go to Mills, Mill College. After that, let me just give you a sense of the progression of philosophers of science that have been here and contributed to a very strong program. Lisa Lloyd, I don't know whether that name means anything to you. Lisa Lloyd was here before she came up for tenure. She went to UC Berkeley and then went uh, to the Midwest. Mark Wilson, who was a Hillary Putnam student, Harvard PhD, he was here for a number of years. He was instrumental in bringing the Churchlands but then the very year he brought them, he left. So when Pat and Paul got here, he was already gone. Um, then, of course, we hired Paul and Pat. And in addition to philosophy of mind, Paul is a very you know, active and prominent philosopher of science. Then we hired Sandy Mitchell as well. I think you know she's a philosopher of biology. She's now at Pittsburgh. Then, after Pat and Paul came, we hired Phil Kitcher. That, of course, uh, uh, was a major hire because Phil was instrumental in helping create the science studies program, and I want to say a word or two about that. So roughly in 89, 90, somewhere in there, maybe a little earlier, we created a science studies program. That was a PhD program in which students would get a joint PhD in philosophy, history, or sociology, and science studies. It required classes together, interaction, um, and Phil succeeded in getting us an extremely law, unprecedented large grant from the National Science Foundation, a million and a half bucks. And what that meant is he, together with the other major, uh, major people who formed it, Stephen Shapin, Martin Rudwick, the historian Robert Westman, Paul, I, uh, Sandy, we all put our energy into science studies, and that meant that there was money, fellowships for graduate students, and some of the best graduate students that came here were in both science studies and philosophy, philosophy of science, and in cognitive science and in philosophy. And that really created what was probably the best group of graduate students in philosophy of science and epistemology we've ever had. Two of them are now well known, Peter Godfrey Smith at Harvard, Kyle Stanford at Irvine, but there were, there were many, many others. So that was a very, very successful program. The last thing I'll say, well, I'll mention a few of the other philosophers of science who came after. Nancy Cartwright, then Bill Bechtel, Craig Callender, Chris Woolrich. For a long, long period of time, we've had a very strong program in philosophy of science. Finally, I'll just say one thing about the Churchlands. And then, yeah. um, the hire of the Churchlands was a, obviously a watershed event. The way I periodized the department, there were two departments before the Churchlands. Then the Churchland came, and there was yet a third department. And then with Pat Churchland's hires, there was a fourth department. The biggest watershed was the hiring of the Churchlands. The interesting thing there, a few interesting things to note. Paul and Pat were not well known when we hired them. It was not a sure thing. They represented a challenge to traditional philosophy. But basically, the department had been looking for a long time to raise its profile and improve the graduate student program. 
Many of us were disappointed in the quality of the program and our visibility. So we tried very